Hi, I'm Mary Griffiths, I'm curator of Modern Art at the Whitworth Art Gallery. I'm Helen Stoke, I'm assistant curator in fine art at the Whitworth Art Gallery. And just a few minutes ago, well actually 50 minutes ago now, we started a, um, a work of art here by Nick Crow and Ian Rawlinson called Six White Horses, which we've been working on now for a few months. And the way this came about, well, actually maybe we should describe first a little bit of what you'd see if you were actually outside. So Whitworth Park is next to the Whitworth Art Gallery. And in that, we've built a very large paddock with white fencing around. And in that paddock now, there are six white horses. There's also floodlights. And then there's also some speakers. And they're playing um, country and western songs, and all of which have the title of six white horses. So we'll talk a little bit about the meaning of that later mm -hmm. on. Um, I'll just mention how Nick and Ian came to make that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, we were thinking about how we could mark the closure of the Whitworth Art Gallery. And Nick Crow and Ian Rawlinson are artists who um, have lived in Manchester for a long time, and Nick now lives in Berlin, and uh, know, this, know the Whitworth very well, and are good friends of ours. And our director, Maria Balshaw, thought it would be a good idea to ask them to, to make a work of art for us. So I had a meeting with them and then just and, and said to them, look, we just want something that um, that closes the gallery and that has some kind of um, meaning for that moment and just go away and think about it. And a, a, good, a few weeks later, they came back with this beautiful little drawing of a paddock in the park with six white horses standing there, a little bit of text describing what was going to happen. And then several months later, that's exactly what has happened. It's Helen who's done nearly all of the work making that happen. So do you want to talk a little bit about the making of it? Yeah, so it, it's it's a kind of vision that's become apparent in the last hour, which is always fantastic, but it's, um, yeah, it, it sounds like a very simple thing to do is to release six white horses into an urban park, but actually it's fairly complicated. So the, the, the first thing that we needed to do is to find the right horses. So um, Nick and Ian really came up with the idea of finding some film and television trained horses who would be very calm and kind of very beautiful and uh, very still in any situation, including in urban park land, which kind of backs onto an incredibly busy bus route and main road uh, and thoroughfare through Manchester. So we found um, a guy called Tony Smart who lives um, down in Woking and we drove down there and met him. And he's the kind of go-to man for beautiful, trained, White horses, and he's done lots of film and television, and he's, he knows what he's doing. He's in Star Wars and lots of things with the BBC and the Guinness adverts and things like that. So we felt like we found the right horses for the job, um, and I think that's just been proven right by the fact that they just come into the park and made it their own and kind of rambling around and doing what horses do, but in a very um, calm and peaceful manner. So this is all at the end of a weekend where there's been lots of events and activities for, for the general public and families and children. And now it's changed tone slightly into mm -hmm. this very quiet, serene activity where there's the paddock and the horses grazing. Now, we haven't seen them now for about 30 minutes. So when we last left them, they'd just come into the paddock and we were getting used to the place. And there's a massive crowd all around that paddock watching and the excitement of those people has been really marvellous and over the past few days when we've been preparing this. So as we've both been working in that, getting it ready for the arrival of the horses, people have been coming up and saying, what's going to happen here? And then when we've said on Sunday at 6 o'clock there'll be six white horses in here, their eyes have really lit up. Mm -hmm. And it's as though at that moment they've just entered into a little um, the world of the fairy tale. And that's happening outside now, so I'm really looking forward to seeing it as the light begins to fall and the floodlights really begin to work, have their effect upon that space. I think it's when we've been talking to people that's been aware of released, when you release white horses into a yeah. car, because it's, it's, I don't know, that's the magical element of it, yeah. where they just kind of, they're free to roam. That's right, and as you said before, in that urban park, because yeah. you see these all the time in the countryside, mm -hmm. but to actually bring them into the city and in a place where you know, there's all of our neighbourhood, you know, it's, a, it's a really great mixed community, and people might not get the chance to be driving around Cheshire or wherever in mm -hmm. their cars, but to bring those into, into the centre of our place 
and you were saying that you're held because you know, we've got we've got great collections here but of works of art. There's a most of our works are often about landscape, and we've done loads of exhibitions that explore that idea of landscape and the idea of pastoral and the myth, the mythologisation the British have especially done around the idea of land and landscape, yeah. and then to to twist that by bringing it into the middle of Manchester mm. is really rather a remarkable thing. It is, it's that kind of ideology, and it's a very romantic ideology mm. that we've kind of made to happen. And I think as the light starts to fade and the moonlight starts to take over and the theatrical lighting starts to take over, that would be very, a kind of eerie but very beautiful and, and very kind of um, magical moment that you often find in kind of romantic painting and romantic poetry, particularly that you don't often find walk through Manchester City right. Centre. It reminded me that so there's that really lovely little print by um, someone Tom that I'd used. Yes. Actually, it was a print, it's a drawing that I used in an exhibition a few years ago in the Land of Venus. And in that, there's a scene where there's a little cottage and there's, but there's a family moving through a cornfield towards that little house with a little light in the window burning. Mm. Um, and it's dusk and it's, and it's a late summer's evening. Mm. And that's what's happening outside now with all of those families and all of those people watching those forces in that place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It kind of, when, when I was thinking about the collection, although you've got the obvious connotations with um, a course is representing art, it was the David Cox Welsh funeral. And I think it was because we were talking about um, the horses might have huddled beneath the trees and, and I was thinking about the people huddled together as a community in a, in a place that I knew, they knew very well, but they, they came together in a kind of moment of mourning mm. and they were huddled beneath the trees in a landscape. And I just thought if it rains that might be what happens. Yeah, you know? that's really <laughs> they come together as a community. Yeah. yeah. Now that takes us nicely to this business of well, why is it six white horses? Mm. Um, so in the so all of this of course we you know whenever we're talking about it, it's all to do with Nick Crow and Ian Rawlinson. It's their idea. Mm. Um, so the six white horses Features in all of these country and western songs. And of course, six white horses would pull a funeral carriage if you would chosen to have the white horses rather than the black horses. And in the songs that are playing at this moment, they're all to do with the six white horses coming to fetch the dead person away to heaven, perhaps hell as well. Mm. So that the lead that you just made with that David Cox, is it David mm. Cox? Yeah? yeah, David Cox drawing is um is important. Mm. What else do you think about the business? I think it, I think it's the, the fact that you don't like you're just saying that if you're going to go to heaven and hell, there's the, the there's the fine line I think throughout um, the kind of biblical narrative and mythological narrative if you don't know whether they they bring good or evil. Yeah. They bring an ending, but you don't quite know whether it's a good ending yeah. or an evil ending. Because hell and hell, we're just discussing this earlier on because of course it goes back to. Christian um, mythology as well, so um, well, Christian thinking. Um, so, the, of course, the four horsemen of the apocalypse um, in, the, in Revelations, and then also the pale rider. So, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, sort of pulling the four corners of the earth, revealing um, the truth at that moment, but also the pale rider being death. So, there's that. There's that um, balance between the revelation of truths, the bringing of death as well mm -hmm. into, a, into that relationship. Now what else were we talking about? Well there's also an ambiguity with that because some interpretations is, is that, that the white horse brings the saviour as well, so there's, yeah. there's that ambiguity as well, there's lots of different interpretations yeah. of the, the pale rider, but we were also talking about in Celtic mythology and Bronze Age mythology, mythology, Hindu mythology. Yeah. So the White Horse of Uppington. Mm. So there it is. So there's those prehistoric people um, scratching out an image of a horse on that chalk landscape. So of course they you know, cut into the turf and lo and behold it chalk beneath them. And so that's what makes the White Horse. So the process of making that work of art makes it a White Horse, but it ties so closely to that spectral mm -hmm. and um, deeply significant image of the white horse. Mm -hmm. And it's the most common hillside kind of um, yeah. image that we find yes. in, uh, in England. Yeah. So there's you know there's, there's 
plenty of examples in the South Indian with the chalk landscape. Um, and then most recently we were just thinking about Mark Wallinger wanting mm -hmm. to make that horse for Ebb's fleet. Mm -hmm. And so it was going to be a sculpture of a horse, but it will be eventually once, once the funding is down, that sculpture of the horse on the landscape. And he's done a, 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 a life-size version of the horse, which was, is, I think it's about a 50th of the version of the size mm -hmm. it's going to be. And of course there he is, he's chosen that white horse to be standing within that landscape. Mm -hmm. But people are refer or are referring to that as the Angel of the South, aren't they? No. Mm -hmm. In lots of ways. But um, yeah, it'll kind of tower above that landscape. Mm -hmm. And you know, you listening, of course, you'll be thinking of all of those um, different examples of where white horses appear. There's that kids' program from the 1960s, and the record that came from where white horses, and there's white horse whiskey. Guinness had the most famous things. What's the, the, um, the um, Actually, um, old, old spice, old spice, all of those, and you then you just start bringing them back and think, yeah, white horses. Well, it's the drama. Part. It's the drama yeah. that's associated with them. Yeah. Yeah. The, the drama had the vision of the yeah. yeah. So we know that in the old spice one and in the Guinness, because it's kind of the same now, but you yeah. see, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. white horse turning into a surf. Yeah. And then there's the kind of literary you know, representations. So in, in his own mythology, you kind of. Tolkien used the white horse as the ultimate kind of animal friend as opposed to Gandalf's yeah. white horse. Mm. So in in that so there's the business of the horse being um, this virile image, this kind of image of power, mm. the, the horse and the person riding the horse itself. Um, and then what else do you think it is? About the well, horse? it's just so kind of a ethereal. Yes. Kind of fairy land equality, yeah. equality too. So you get that kind of throbbing gristle of a horse. <laughs> <laughs> like you get something like Equus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that kind of strange all the way. So as you described earlier on, it's the business of that. Okay, well, in some time, sometimes it's a, it, is, it um, represents evil coming in. So you know, the, the pale line of evil and death being synonymous within Christian thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so um, evil, you know, giving. Adam and Eve, eating of the apple, and that brings sin into the world. And of course, as soon as he brings sin into the world, then he brought death. But then the white horse also being redemptive in, some, in some imagery. Um, and then you, you remind me, you just mentioned just a, Well, just the intended sort of death is the, the kind of corporate reality of, yes. of, mus of a muscular beast. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but then there's also so all, the the right. all of the right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then there's a spiritual element, the kind of ethereal element, yes. beyond. Mm -hmm. And then as you, as you described earlier on as well, that, that um, fabulous image of the horse within fairy tale and within mm. literary culture. Mm. It's just gorgeous. <laughs> well, we've got a moment for that, I think, before, because, you know, as curators, we're always worried about the kind of logistics and the timings mm. and the... And making it look good and the aesthetics, and but then just, I think as soon as they actually entered the, they were released into the paddock. I don't know. I just got a shiver. It was very moving. It um, yes. So we're standing next to Nick and Ian, of course, and mm -hmm. Helen and I have been running around all day, making sure that various things are okay, and Nick and Ian have been doing that as well, picking Melissa from the paddock and doing all these really kind of hands-on things since nine o'clock this morning and then but then with that release of the horses they at one moment they're still horses they're flesh and blood that has been brought up from where's James not Woking Woking and it's a Staffordshire. Staffordshire. so they're that kind of horse they're flesh and blood horses but they also at that moment of release became something um some, became some kind of remarkable signifier which in some ways, we don't know what that is yet because it's it's only just happening. We didn't know what the work of art was really going to be, as you never do until the work of art is made. Yeah, and we've also had a shift in conditions, I think, as well. So we've had this kind of weekend of on and off sunshine and yeah. warmth and fireworks and music and, and kind of celebration. And then today has definitely been a tangible shift in, in climate, but it feels very autumnal. Yeah, it's a kind of crossing over into from summer into autumn, and I think yeah. that's 
you could, I don't think you could have done that. <laughs> and of course, the whole point, that's why the whole point of the word Marcos was to mark this moment in our history. So I've been here for 14 years. How long have you been here? Eight. Eight years. And um, so I've been here a long time. And it's it's a it's a it's a remarkable moment in the world's history where from tomorrow we're not open for almost a year. Where we've got plenty of things to do when we're running around doing exhibitions for the reopening and there's all of this building work going on. But we're not open to the public and we don't have any exhibitions on for several months. That's a really strange thing when you're a curator, mm -hmm. whether you're the BSAs or the cleaners or the house services staff, because without your public, you're, you're, you're lost in a way. So here we are now in this, in this, in this changed moment that's being marked by this work of art to begin to make what the Whitworth will be in the future. So of course all of the, all of the architecture has been going on. There's been lots of planning already. But now is really the moment where we enter that, that liminal phase which will lead towards our reopening. Mm. There's a definite sense of closure to yeah. it, I think, and at midnight yeah. when, it, when it finally does close. It, there's that idea of closure, but I think we all feel very optimistic about the fact mm. that it's a good yeah. It's a good closure. It means we're going to move on and we'll move on to better things. Yeah. And, uh, what's yeah. that Psychological <laughs> yeah. closure. It's not. You're <laughs> right. It's, it's it's not a bad closure for us, and it's not a bad closure for the public either. I really believe because mm -hmm. we're really not going to end up with. Uh, uh, we're not going to. We're not going to lose what the Whitworth is already. That thing that we've been you know, part of for so many years. It's going. That's going to still be there, but there's going to be more of it. Mm -hmm. So tonight is is kind of a a lament. Yes. There's a sense of the. The kind of obvious symbolism of what we've just been talking about, but at the same time, it's a beautiful way to close. That's right. So I think that's enough. It's a beautiful way to close. Okay. <laughs>